Now, I have a very unpopular opinion in this country, which is somewhat popular outside of it, which is that Saddam Hussein, while horrible in all the ways that we claim he was horrible, was in fact holding together some powder keg and that was using, it was a relatively secular government and that brought some order to a potentially very chaotic uh, communal uh, situation. His sons, of course, were, you know, one, one in particular was a stone cold psychopath. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, Saddam Hussein did terrible, horrible things by American standards. But if we evaluated him by the standards of the region, um, we might come up with a different answer. Is there anything to that? I mean, he was obviously a bad guy. He, he certainly provided stability for the region. No doubt about that. Yeah. Have you ever seen the video uh, by which he took over the, uh, the bath party? No. So he, he shows up on stage smoking a cigar and he, he says, uh, we have a special guest today. And this guy comes to the microphone and starts saying, I've plotted against Saddam and I, I'm here to read the names of my co-conspirators. And you see panic take over in the audience and names are called and people are let out of the auditorium. And people start to understand that everyone who's let out is going to be killed. Yep. And so they start screaming like, you know, long live Saddam, we love Saddam in order to save their own lives. My understanding is, is that the people who were left were given sidearms to execute the people who had been let out to consolidate power around a founding atrocity. Um, to me, that's an example of this message violence concept that for people who don't speak other languages, violence and even sadistic language is their poetry. And there's poetry in which our fighters who are doing the right thing and are, are on the side, you know, the side of the angels uh, are engaging in brutal poetry. And the other side is engaged in, in some sort of very disturbing um, art form. Is there a way of looking at this that's profitable that people who have not been in battle can understand about how, how these messages are used to hold together societies that are dangerous and fragile? Well, as you pointed out, I mean, all human beings have a guttural reaction to violence. And violence is a language that every single human being understands. You know, you were asking me earlier what languages I speak, and I said English. And you said you didn't learn any Arabic. And I said, well, I learned enough to say, get down, show me your hands. But, but when I would speak those words in Arabic to, you know, if we enter a building, enter a home, and there's, you know, a military age male, and I'd be speaking to him in Arabic, he didn't, he didn't even understand that I was even trying to speak Arabic. A, because my Arabic's bad, and B, because it's it's just he's not expecting that and so they don't they don't respond very right. seldom would i have until we get them to calm down a little bit then i could maybe speak a little bit of arabic to them but in that initial moment of terror there's they don't understand they don't understand what you're saying they're not they're not ready to hear it uh, but when you have somebody that is resistant clearly resistant there the, there is some nonverbal communication that you can do that is violence and they will understand it and the other people that see it will understand it so there's no doubt that violence is a method of communicating with people a message stronger than words in many cases and f people like saddam people like isis they'll absolutely use that to the best of their ability and then they'll exploit when things happen you know one of the one of the horrible strategic losses or strategic setbacks we had in in the iraq war was the the abuses that went on at the abu Ghraib prison because now we had photographs of these americans with doing things that look like extreme torture to the prisoners there and and the al-qaeda elements just absolutely took those and ran with them to make to fuel that insurgency and it did it did a great job of fueling that insurgency so you have to be very very careful about 
the way you treat your enemy because if you treat if you mistreat the enemy then the enemy will use that as propaganda and they would do that on purpose they they would love nothing more for than than for you to accidentally kill a kid or you know drop a bomb on a mosque or drop a bomb they love they absolutely would love that and so we had to do everything in our power to prevent those things from happening because the strategic the negative strategic impact was phenomenal when events like that occurred did you watch the video of the Jordanian pilot who was executed by ISIS? Yes. Yeah. So a lot of people stateside did not watch that video. And one of the things that I found uh, very interesting about it was that it had a point that was disguised by our unwillingness to watch the video. Now, maybe it's important that ISIS not be allowed to communicate its point. But the point was, you were up there in the skies um, meeting out very particular forms of death, in particular incinerating people and burying them in rubble. And our aim in this video is to subject a captured pilot to the exact form of death that you are dispensing from the skies. And so you're normally not here to see this, let this be your death. And, you know, it was cinematically beyond belief. It was shot to be gorgeous and to be repugnant and sickening and that concept of a hollywood style death filmed for real a snuff film if you will with a point and then offering bounties showing the homes of the jordanian pilots you know by street i think in amman jordan um, my sense was is that americans didn't pick up anything of what was going on because we decided that we didn't want our population exposed to anything coming from the other side. Even their propaganda informed us as to how they were thinking and feeling, but it was as if we plugged our ears and didn't want to understand what we were watching. Do you, do you see that? I, I, I see, yeah, and I would agree with the point that when you disconnect people from war, it, it's, they lose track, right? I mean, in America, you know, we, we, when I was in Ramadi in 2006, I was, you know, sitting in some combat outpost in the middle of nowhere with mortar shells coming in. And meanwhile, everyone in America was, you know, going to the mall and driving around their SUV and ordering a Starbucks. I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. I'm not mad at that, but there's a definite detachment there. I'm mad at that. <laughs> no, here's the, here's why I'm mad at that. First of all, I, I think I'm slightly older than you are. Um, and so I have some memories of the Vietnam War as it was playing out on American television. That's some of my earliest uh, childhood memories. And let me say this, it was spectacularly gruesome. What we saw on the TV during that period of time, I believe that my parents turned off the TV um, when it showed an image of a GI's head on a pike. And it was just like, okay, this is too much. Um, and on the one hand, this was real information coming from the war. And on the other hand, it was propaganda. It was meant to strike fear in our hearts. Um, there was a self-hatred that was playing out just as there was concern about the excesses of American kids being turned loose in a jungle with too little discipline and supervision. I mean, there was so much happening in Vietnam, um, which was hard to pull apart. And what I found was, is that after that war, we never went into a conflict the same way again. The embedded journalists didn't seem to want to report in the same way that a non-embedded journalist did. And there's a need that we have to be able to go to war without constantly second guessing ourselves and putting our own troops in harm's way and not working through all of our psychological nonsense when we have people who are, you know, definitely at risk uh, in doing our work as, as the military. I don't know that we've ever really come to grips with the lessons of Vietnam. We, we don't have a clear sense that we should go to war as a nation where the newsreels should talk about our side versus the other side. We don't know how to do this. Um, do you have a sense that like my sense is, is that Vietnam really broke something in terms of our ability to go to war? It, 
Vietnam was, you know, and I've been lucky enough to have a, a lot of uh, podcast guests that were in Vietnam and their experiences were all different. I mean, from one guy, Captain Charlie Plum, who was shot down and was in the Hanoi Hilton for six years. I've had uh, SOG operators, special operations or um, studies and observation group guys that were fighting behind the lines in Cambodia and Laos. I've had helicopter pilot that was shot down in, in the jungle prisoner uh, prisons for months and months being tortured and, and mock executed the whole nine yards. So th- what was what was horrible, there's so many horrible things about Vietnam. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I've, I've did, I did a podcast about the My Lai massacre, which, which really is by far the most, the biggest atrocity that American troops have ever committed. And it was absolutely heinous. Now you could go to Sand Creek and maybe some of the Native Americans, there were some, some significant horrible atrocities there as well. Those generally weren't as clear cut, you know, most of those had American soldiers that were saying, no, stop. Right. Me lie for a while for for at least several hours it was no no one no one was stopping so what you had you know what you have i think what with the press and the media in vietnam was you had a lens into what war is and in war you're killing other people right and when you're killing other people it's you know you you just take one step back if you don't know what that other person did and you take one step back and you watch someone kill someone else, that, that is that is not gonna go over well in most people's stomachs. Most people are gonna look at that and say, why is this happening? Why are we doing this? So that's what happened in, in Vietnam. You take one step back and you see, you take one step back and what you see is killing. You see right. a human beings killing other human beings and why in God's name are we doing this? And, and so that, that's what I think happened in Vietnam. How it broke us, I mean, I don't know if broke us is the right word, but we certainly are more cautious and should be more cautious always about going to war. I mean, you know, you, you want to talk to the people that don't want to go to war. It's the people that have been to war, the people that have had their friends get killed. Like they're the ones that don't want to go to war unless it's absolutely necessary, unless we've tried every other method, unless we've used every other technique that we could use to, to prevent us from going to war. Now that when you have to go to war, like go to war and win. That's that's my attitude. We don't want to go to war at all. If we have to go, go and win. Win as quick as you can. We'll use whatever means necessary to achieve a quick dominant victory. Uh, I mean, the, 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 there's so much, and that's so so rich as an answer. I guess where I want to go back to is, I think that it's irresponsible for us as a nation to allow this much insulation of the home front from the raw facts of what we're doing abroad. And that if you're going to main, if you know, if you take my assessment that the United States is the most dangerous machine ever constructed, right? We do not have the right to wield that power if we're not interested in what it looks like and what it means. If we're not willing to celebrate heroes who come back from the battlefield, if we're not willing to look at murderers and psychopaths who fought under our flag. I mean, you know, my belief is, is that to have a mature relationship with your country requires being able to look at something like me Lai and seeing it for the horror that it was and still coming to an understanding that there's going to be some amount of breakdown that looks something like that, maybe not that bad, anytime we deploy troops, that that's part of what it means to deploy troops is, is that you can't monitor how every particular unit functions and particularly if there are no eyes on them. One of the things that I've said before is that if you go to war, you have to be willing, you have to have the, the will, the will for the following two things to happen. Number one is you have to have the will to kill. And when I say kill, I'm not just talking about killing your enemy because although you'll try and kill your enemy, you will absolutely have collateral damage in war and innocent people are going to die. And if you think that you can pull off a war without killing innocent people, you're wrong. So you have to be willing to do that. You have to make sure that the cause, the reason 
the, the why behind why you're going to war. You m- need to make sure that you understand that you will kill innocent people and you have to be willing to do that. Even if you net save innocent lives, there will always be innocent casualties. There will absolutely be innocent yeah. casualties. And the other will that you have to have is you have to have the will to die. And that is that no matter how surgical you are, no matter how good your weapons are, no matter, no matter how good your technology is, you, when you go to war, you will have young American men and women being killed in horrible ways, way too young, over and over and over again. And if you're not ready for those two things, then you need to stop and think about what you're actually doing. Yeah. 